Prior to beginning the activity, please be sure to review the faculty information and disclosure statements, as well as the learning objectives. After listening to the activity, complete the post-test by clicking the Earn Credit link in the episode description. Downloadable slides and resources are also available. The following presentation is copyrighted by Medscape. No use, broadcast, or recording of this presentation or any part thereof is permitted without the written authorization of Medscape. The following presentation is part of a certified educational activity provided by Medscape Education and supported by an educational grant from Intracellular Therapies. Hello, I'm Dr. Denise Vanacor, Associate Dean and Professor of Nursing at Eastern University in Wayne, Pennsylvania. Welcome to this program titled Module 1, Clinical Queries in Bipolar Depression, what tools are best for screening and diagnosis? Joining me today is Dr. Manpreet Singh, Associate Professor of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at Stanford University. Welcome. Thank you, Denise. Glad to be here with you today. Manpreet, I'm so excited that we're here to have this chat. So we're going to begin by talking about a case. And this case is a 27-year-old teacher who presents with symptoms of depression uh, she's a new patient. She's treatment naive. She's never been uh, seen by psychiatry uh, or primary care. She fills out the RMS. What will the RMS tell you about this patient's depressive symptoms? Yeah, sure, Denise. I'd be happy to. The RMS, or the Rapid Mood Sc Screener, is a new kid on the block, and it's a six-question screener to remind practitioners to um, ask about mania symptoms and also risk factors for mania symptoms when um, they are evaluating someone who presents with mood symptoms. So for example, they practitioners might ask questions about different periods of time, at least six different periods of time that lasted two weeks or more when a patient felt very depressed, if they had problems with depression before the age of 18, if they had to stop or change an antidepressant because it made them highly irritable or hyper, or if they've ever had a period of at least one week during which they were more talkative, had racing thoughts, were unusually happy, outgoing, or energetic, or had any period where they needed less sleep. These cardinal symptoms are very that are very common are kind of early warning signs or potential warning signs that there might be a bipolar diagnosis. So if you use a rapid screener, you need about four out of the six symptoms or responses um, that are affirmative to about four of symptoms that um, gives you maybe a clue that you might need to probe a little bit deeper. So great. So we've looked at this patient and she did score a four um, and she's endorsed that decrease in sleep. So, you know, how do you determine clinically if this patient has bipolar disorder versus MDD? Great. So the first thing I'll do is oftentimes confirm a diagnosis of depression, and I'll use diagnostic criteria from the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, which tells us that we need to be looking out for a depressed mood or loss of interest or pleasure or anhedonia, plus of the Siggy cap symptoms, whether it's sleep, um, decreased need, uh, for, uh, sorry, decreased sleep or excessive sleep, um, uh, uh, psychomotor agitation or retardation, fatigue, loss of energy, guilt, impairments in concentration, and then of course um, assessing for uh, suicidal thoughts um, or behaviors. And of course, the depression needs to be present for at least two weeks or more to be um, to meet criteria for an episode and must um, impair functioning um, and uh, cause significant distress and not be attributable to substance use or other um, medical conditions. Right, so how would you take that next step in looking at bipolar depression versus um, uh, you know, maybe a manic or hypomanic episode? So now you know, our teacher has had um, an evaluation confirmed depression and we've done an RMS that seems to suggest there might be something more uh, than straight bread and butter depression going on. So I'll go into the diagnostic criteria for um, for bipolar disorder, we'll, which we'll talk about in a moment. But one of the first things we want to do is assess for level of severity is mania 
a full threshold, like as in a manic episode, which requires at least a week or more or might necessitate hospitalization because of the marked impairment in functioning. Um, this may be attributable to psychotic symptoms or other areas of impairment in a, a patient's life that lands them in the hospital. And if you have euphoric or um, uh, excitable moods, um, then you only need um, three or more core symptoms. If you're primarily irritable, you'll need four or more. And in a hypomanic situation, it's generally distinguished um, by time criteria. So where a manic episode uh, requires at least a week, 50% of the day um, or more uh, with that index mood um, plus associated symptoms, a hypomanic episode usually lasts um, at least four days or more and generally is less severe, um, not as functionally impairing, usually doesn't lead to hospitalization. And, um, and usually um, the patient hasn't had a history of a prior manic episode. So in this patient, we now know she has MDD and she does not have a history of mania or hypomania. Um, and then how would you treat and monitor this patient long-term? Yeah, I mean, constant evaluation and reevaluation is um, necessary. Ruling out bipolar disorder can be very helpful um, because um, it can help us understand where we might go in terms of treatment. I'd be more comfortable, for example, starting a patient on an antidepressant, having known that um, if I'm getting some screening symptoms, I've actually do, done the due diligence to rule out bipolar disorder because uh, giving a patient an antidepressant, for example, could actually um, uh, lead to activation um, and uh, of mania or hypomania symptoms. So um, treating bipolar, uh, treating unipolar depression, I would follow the usual treatment guidelines for um, treating unipolar depression, and then I'd still do the business of constantly evaluating and reevaluating. Denise, patients come into my office. Um, and I assess for mania symptoms as well as depressive symptoms at every single encounter. That enables me to ensure that I'm not missing uh, mania symptoms in, in those patients that are presenting with a mood disorder. So I know one uh, good mnemonic for uh, assessing manic, uh, manic features during a, or manic symptoms during a, uh, a clinical assessment is dig fast. Can you talk a little bit about that mnemonic and how you use that in clinical practice? Yeah, you bet. You know, um, we oftentimes get to the trouble that's associated with a mania symptom pretty quickly because that's what patients present with, their impaired in, uh, impairment in functioning. But what I would say is that you've got to start first with asking the patient how they're feeling. What is the index mood? Is it um, euphoria? cheerful, high, terrific, not feeling your normal self, or is it irritability and maybe of an explosive nature? And then after you've established that index mood and you, for example, establish the time criteria, how long has it lasted? Every day, 50% of the day for at least a week, four days or less. And that gives us a, some idea of whether we're dealing with some subsyndromal or syndromal mania. And then you go into the associated symptoms. What hangs with that euphoric, elevated, cheerful mood or explosive irritability? Because if it's, um, if it's euphoric, then you'll need at least three symptoms. And if it's explosive irritability, then you'll need more symptoms or four symptoms of, um, of dig fast. So what is dig fast? Dig fast. I like to use these particular um, words associated with them because they kind of get at the, um, the secondary symptom uh, criteria in DSM. D is for distractibility. I for increased goal-directed activity. G is grandiosity, um, feeling like you could do things that nobody else can do, believing that you were maybe like a god. Um, F is flight of ideas, um, going from one topic to the other, the set shifting in attention that typically is observed in a manic episode. A is for accelerated speech, um, because S, uh, which comes afterwards, is sleep, decreased need for sleep. And um, T, I think of as trouble, um, anything that might land a patient in trouble, indiscretion, impulsivity, hypersexual behaviors, sex, drugs, and rock and roll, I guess you could say. And different people use DIGFAST sort of in different variations of what I just described. 
Um, and I would just recommend that clinicians use one that helps them remember these symptoms and these criteria because they can be very confusing. And it allows you to also kind of get into the rhythm of asking these questions on a routine basis when patients present with mood symptoms and repeat it as um, often as you can because there's never a situation where asking a patient if they're manic, one and done, makes any sense. Um, this is something that requires um, observation over time. I agree. I think that using that mnemonic or using a mnemonic to help you remember those symptoms and asking it the same way each time will really make sure that you're keeping an eye on the patient. Um, so I'm going to turn this over to you. We're going to talk about another case. Yeah, so let's talk about our second case. Um, now we're talking about a 27-year-old nurse who presents with symptoms of depression, and she's a returning patient. She's had three episodes of depression, okay? And she's previously been on citalopram and venlafaxine. So here she presents to your um, clinic, and, um, and I'd ask you, Denise, what kind of tools would you use when you're screening a patient for depression? So the tools that um, I generally use in clinical practice are the PHQ-9. Um, and the one thing that I really love about the PHQ-9 is it's nine questions. So it's, it's again, pretty quick. Um, that ninth question um, always speaks to any kind of um, self-harm or suicidality. So that's, it's always a good gauge. Um, it's easily scored. And, you know, one of the things you could do with the PHQ-9 is really embed it in your EMR and you can uh, have the patients do it before they even get to see you. So you can see the numbers and see what things look like pretty quickly. Um, one of the other um, advantages, you can track it as you're treating patients. Um, and it's been around for quite some time. So it's quite a reliable and valid tool. So I really like that as one. The second tool that I use, um, which I think is always important to do whenever you're trying to screen somebody to rule in uh, MDD or major depressive disorder is also consider using the MDQ, which is the mood disorder questionnaire. And this helps you to know that you have to screen further for a bipolar episode or that you've screened out for a bipolar episode and can go ahead and successfully treat your patient for a major depressive disorder. So the MDQ is actually a 15 question tool. 13 of those questions are pretty straightforward uh, because they're yes, no questions. Uh, the last two really talk more about uh, the severity of the symptoms. And so give you a little bit more insight um, as to whether or not the patient is um, having a lot of difficulty with those symptoms that they're, uh, that they're uh, showing you. Yeah, and in contrast to the RMS, it sounds um, too that PHQ-9 and MDQ are very often used in primary care settings. Um, and I love your point about the EMR um, integration. I think that can help practitioners out a lot to have those um, embedded into their workflows. Um, uh, so your patient, um, the nurse, uh, completes the PHQ-9 and MDQ and screens positive on the PHQ-9 for MDD and the PHQ-9 item nine, or the suicidal question is um, answered no, thankfully. Um, and she screens negative for MDQ um, for bipolar with a score of six. So what challenges do you face when differentiating bipolar disorder from unipolar depression when patients present with a unipolar um, major depressive episode? So, you know, I think here um, it's it's really important to make sure that um, you look at not just um, the patient screening tools, but you really do a good clinical exam here. Um, because as you start to um, look at what the patient might be telling you about, you might find that um, they've been on two antidepressants already, like our nurse has. Um, and I call these um, sometimes antidepressant misadventures because patients uh, get on them, they feel a little bit better for a short while, and then all of a sudden they develop an increase in irritability or an increase in mood liability, and then they stop the antidepressant, they feel a little bit better, and that bodes to making sure that you're on the right track. Um, sometimes patients with MDD may have um, sub-threshold symptoms of hypomania. 
And that can often lead to misdiagnosis. And so when I see someone who's failed two other antidepressants, um, I, then, I then start to really take a look at what other uh, symptoms we might be looking at. Um, so some of the things that we wanna check on is family history. So who's your mommy and who's your daddy? Um, what uh, multiple relatives may have had other uh, depressive or bipolar or even borderline personality disorder problems. So what other family history members do we have that could um, indicate to us that this might not just be simple depression, that this could be a history that includes bipolar disorder. Also, when we see the course of the illness, we see a much younger onset, usually before the age of um, 25. And so again, uh, we see that patients who are younger, um, you know, this woman has already been on uh, two antidepressants and she's 27. So we know that this has started um, at an earlier age. Um, and the more recurrent episodes you have, uh, the more difficult it gets to tease out the symptoms. So we also know that episodes often start and stop abruptly, and that's why patients stop their antidepressants when they start to not feel well, and all of a sudden the symptoms seem to disappear. Um, treatment response is a big one. We talked about the fact she's failed two antidepressants already. Um, and then sometimes we see that antidepressant-induced mania, which is, which is another part of the problem. Um, and then last, we see chaotic relationships in um, with work with social relationships, not being able, maybe they've been divorced already at the age of 27, a time or two. Um, you know, again, they also might have a comorbid a substance use history. Um, so they may be uh, using something else. So many of these other symptoms or clues can help us either rule in or kind of finally rule out that possibility of a bipolar disorder. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more that a detailed patient history and being very thoughtful about the entire holistic picture besides just the symptom screening end up becoming the most critical for um, approximating um, or getting you closer to the correct diagnosis. So for this nurse, she uh, further clarifies um, on the MDQ that she actually does have more symptoms when you probe further and do that more comprehensive evaluation. And she also explains that she's had several residual symptoms um, with previous treatment that never really went away. The patient's concerned with this new diagnosis. And so, you know, how do you talk her through that, wow, you know, we initially thought this was unipolar depression, but it turns out that it's looking more like it could be bipolar depression. And um, that merits a different treatment plan, perhaps, um, and some careful reevaluation um, of, of the history. So what what kind of tips would you um, suggest in terms of how we do this better and also um, support this patient in a way that leads to um, uh, an accurate diagnosis and treatment course. I think, you know, this is where a really good time to spend some time talking to the patient about um, the, the diagnosis. And, you know, patients are always concerned. It's kind of okay to have depression. It's kind of like, um, it's an, that's an all right diagnosis. But when we get to that bipolar disorder diagnosis, that one becomes a little bit stigmatizing. And, um, I'm, you know, definitely a fan of avoiding any kind of stigma in mental health because we have enough problems, but, you know, here is a good time to talk to the patient about, you know, we, I go over how unipolar depression means there's just depressive symptoms on one side. This just means you have symptoms on both sides. Um, and it, you know, it's another label that we give it, but it's treated differently. And it's important that we get to the root of it and we treat to remission, just like we would if she had major depressive disorder. Um, this is a good time to work with a therapist as well to help patients um, really understand and work with their diagnosis. Um, and I think, you know, um, it's, it's important to have those open conversations with patients um, and provide uh, opportunities for other education where they can go meet other patients and see that uh, bipolar disorder is not um, a life ending disease. Um, it can be treated, um, it, you know, it, it, it is not as stigmatizing as they think. Um, and yes, um, she can have a perfectly full life and, and quality of life. And that's the important part. 
Yeah, absolutely. Couldn't agree with you more on the on the destigmatizing and um, really it takes a village, doesn't it? Um, a team approach to collaborate um, both with patients, but also all um, healthcare professionals in order for us to make progress with um, doing comprehensive evaluations and um, treatment plans for patients with this complex and fascinating disorder. I think a really good point to the team approach for mood disorders in particular is the idea that, you know, the more eyes on the patient, um, the better uh, the patient care is because more people are actually taking a look at that patient's symptoms and, and figuring that out. So I'm, I'm a true fan of involving our pharmacists, um, our nurses, um, our therapists, um, our psychiatrists. I, I, I love uh, working with our psychiatrists. Um, they're just amazing to help with anything. We use something called Slack. There's a lot of great digital tools you can use, um, but it's a great way to pop a quick question out to a team of people and say, hey, you know, I have this patient with this, this, and this problem. This is what I'm thinking of doing. Um, does anybody see any red flags with that? It's great to ask questions. It's a great way to communicate fast and easy. There are other digital tools as well, but anything we can do to actually help patients really have more uh, providers to lean on as well as they are going through their treatment process, I think is really, really important. You bet. So I want to thank you for being with me today and having this wonderful discussion on bipolar disorder. And I want to thank the audience for participating in this activity. Uh, please continue on to answer the questions that follow and complete the evaluation tool.